Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Monica Ranta, and I'm a vice, vice president of international sales at LKC Technologies, manufacturer of visual electrophysiology devices, of course. I am really delighted to have the opportunity to moderate this session, section four of our series, Women in Visual Electrophysiology. In the past 45 years, our team has seen tremendous progress and research done by women in this field. And with this series, we would like to honor the achievement of all women. Today, I welcome Dr. Ruth Hamilton that will represent the Europe and Middle East. Welcome, Dr. Ruth. Hi, and thank you for having me. So, Dr. Ruth Hamilton will present her research on the effect of maternal opioid use during pregnancy on children's vision. That you can see the title on our slide. And I would like to say a few words, if you don't mind, Dr. Hamilton. No, so, Dr. Hamilton is the consultant clinical scientist at Pediatric Physiological Measurement at the Royal Hospital for Children in Glasgow, UK. Or Actually, it's in Scotland, yes? <laughs> then she runs the Pediatric Visual Electrophysiology Service, and she works in audiology, neurology, respiratory, ENT, and neonatal service. As you can guess, her main interest or the area, the research area, are pre- and perinatal influences on children's vision. Then we also know that she's very interested in reference data, patient-friendly visual electrophysiology, teleophthalmology, digital vision tests, and I guess many other things. And Dr. Hamilton is currently holding the position of the president of International Society of Clinical Electrophysiology of Vision. So she's leading the group of gurus in ERG. And that's why I would like to ask the question that is very much connected to the current position. So, Dr. Hamilton, may I ask my first question? Please. So, how do you see the future of the visual electrophysiology, especially considering that now you can really influence that? <laughs> yeah, so um, it's great being president um, and, and being um, leading the gurus does not, not make me one of them. There are so many well-informed people which um, we're lucky to draw on as a society. The future for electrophysiology has got to lie in quicker and easier tests, you know, more accessible tests so that they can be um, used by patients in developing economies and in remote regions. You know, visual electrophysiology is it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. It's um, able to objectively and very specifically uh, assess function and lo localise dysfunction right down to cellular level and um, that degree of accuracy. And it bridges all of the structural information that we can get from imaging and from clinical um, exam. And it can link that with all of the psychophysical things that, that we measure, like acuities and fields. And often, if there's a disparity between these, electrophysiology is your only way of working out why that disparity exists. So we've got these international standards as well. We've had them for decades and decades. And thanks to those, we've got test comparability and repeatability that's really seldom achieved across clinical or laboratory tests. But of course, none of these things are in use at all if our patients can't access the tests. And so we really need to do two things from now, as I see it. The first one is we need to diversify our service delivery model. We will always need experts sitting in tertiary care hospitals delivering the highest quality, most detailed testing. That's always going to be needed. But we need another way of testing where we can do it in the community, we can do it in the fields, we can do it where our patients are, all of those ones that currently aren't accessing it. And then the other thing that we need to do is we need to start harnessing better the technologies that are already in place in other clinical measurement fields. So I'm talking about things like wireless electrodes, advanced signal processing, virtual reality, for example, eye tracking, machine learning, there's loads of them harmonized reference data, which we could maybe talk about later. So th the way that I see it, it's relatively easy to do an OCT and to interpret it. And that's the space where visual electrophysiology also needs to be. 
I have to say I'm really happy to hear that because I think we have a common target, all of us, all producers. I don't mean only Del Casey, but I think all of us that we are very happy to see that trend. And I believe that to implement that, it's not only the gurus you need, but you also need the young potentials. Yeah. So if you think about and young doctors that are getting into that field, what would you recommend to the young person starting the career in that field to what to consider, what to pay attention to? Yeah, definitely. Well, obviously, first thing is join ISFP's membership is very reasonable. It gives you access to all sorts of benefits. Um, but I think that um, if you've asked for my advice, so, um, it definitely is think about people. So as you start out on your career, watch out for the people around you who are firstly very positive and secondly, who get things done because they're going to help you and support you in a way that maybe more negative individuals um, are, will not be able to. I've been so lucky myself. There's three people particularly that I could identify as, as mentoring me. Um, Professor Daphne McCulloch, um, Dr. Helen McTeer and Dr. Dorothy Thompson. And all three of those have exactly those attributes. They're so generous with their time and they're so knowledgeable and they get so much stuff done. And uh, I've been so fortunate to be able to work with them. And, and um, I would suggest or, or hope that I can start to, to be that sort of person to other people. So when you're starting out, look for people like that and try and hang out with them, it'll help you. Yes, I, I think all those three persons are very well known. So any of us that read the papers about electrophysiology recognize your name and the others. Okay, I would like to continue for a long time, but I think everybody are waiting for your presentation. So I just would like to make a short move to the practical issues. Those of you using the computers, to ask the question, please open this bar and type your questions. We will have a Q&A session at the end. If there will be any questions unanswered, we will contact you individually afterwards. And then it will be also the Q&A session will be presented at our website where will be a recording of that session. For those of you that use the mobile device, just click on this question mark and do exactly the same type. So with that, I would like to hand over to you, Dr. Hamilton. So thank you so much for asking me to talk um, about this, this topic. And the way it's going to go today, I'm going to start by talking about nystagmus. You'll probably all know lots about that. But I want to then go on and talk about how we manage um, and diagnose nystagmus in the electrophysiology clinic. And then I want to tell you about some observations we made in clinic of children with nystagmus but who also had um, a history of exposure to methadone during their mother's pregnancy. And this led us to start a, a 12 year long um, cohort study. And I'm going to talk about that and then discuss the possibility that this entity, fecal opioid syndrome, exists and where nystagmus sits within it. So nystagmus. Um, so we know this. This is um, due to uh, some abnormal crosstalk from defects in the sensory system affecting the developing motor system. If the cause is optic nerve, that's usually obvious on fundoscopy if the child lets you have a look. But retinal disorders may only be identifiable through ERGs. And just of interest, um, uh, Mike Brodsky does say no data to support routine diagnostic neuroimaging in nystagmus. The exception might be suspected achiasmia and other rare um, issues. So Frank Proudlock and Irene Gottlob from um, Leicester in the United Kingdom done so much work in this field. And this is their classification, which is eff effectively based on associated disease. And this classification allows the emphasis to rest on um, treatment, prognosis, genetic investigation, counseling, and so on. The CMAS group also published um, a different categorization, more academic approach to things that identified nine pathological types of nystagmus with some overlap and some division. 
But I'm just drawing your attention over here under both classifications, we have this fusional mild development nystagmus syndrome, and that's relevant for later. So thinking about electrophysiology in the clinic, when a child presents with nystagmus, we need to think about what electrophysiological workup we do. So in our clinic, nobody gets sedated. We do all of these on alert um, children. So if you're seeing any of these issues co-presenting with the nystagmus, then you're immediately going to lean towards um, rational disease and therefore the ERG is indicated. If it's these issues that are cropping up or if you're not able to get a good look at the fundus, then you're thinking more along the lines of albinism or very rarely chiasmal hyperplasia and your VP is going to be indicated. So the ERGs in the infants and children, so the, the, the approach here is to adapt, 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 and I mean adapt from the ISF standard because it was written for compliant adults and not for um, wriggly toddlers um, or upset babies. So first of all, use skin electrodes as modelled here, and this is here with the retival. Um, one of the downsides with um, passive electrodes like these ones is you get a smaller signal, and you can get around this with using um, more extensive averaging, of course. And skin electrodes are part of the current standard. We don't dilate our children for ERGs. You lose a little bit of amplitude in your light adapted ERG, which you can compensate for by averaging. And the advantage is you keep cooperation and you can also move on and do pattern work after the ERG if that's indicated. 20 minutes is a long time in the dark with a grumpy toddler. We shorten to 10 minutes and even five minutes if necessary. 10 minutes has no significant effect on the ERG. And because kids don't like putting their heads into Gantz belt domes, we prefer to use these handheld flashes that are not full field, so you'll get a slight change in the ERG shape. But providing all your reference data has been obtained using the same setup, then you'll retain robust diagnostic criteria. And save yourself some time, record your ERG at the same time as the VP. So there's no point in making the kids sit twice through the same stimulus, which is boring for you, frustrating for them. You have your recording time by doing the two at the same time. VEPs for albinism or indeed for deficient chiasmal crossing, it's really sensitive and specific. Care always needs to be taken as it does with everything, but age appropriate techniques need to be used. And this um, here, we're showing this excess of decussation at the chiasm. And if we look at the difference channel between right and left occipital, then right and left eyes show these mirrored waveforms, which is the key that you're looking for. Pattern on offsets, not pattern reversal. And you, your electrodes should be a bit more lateral than you're maybe used to in order to really sensitively pick up um, the, the uh, excess of crossing. So these are heat maps by Patricia Abkarian. This is a logarithmic scale and a linear scale for flash and onset, respectively. And these are the latencies. The heat maps show where you're most likely to detect um, the, the um, excessive crossing if it exists. And um, as you can see, if you've got a kid under three, there's no point in trying pattern onsets. You're not going to find anything. Between three and 10, try both. And over 10, only use your pattern onset. And you need to watch for the asymmetry at an appropriate latency. So they're the tests that we're going to do. And this is just a little example of what the infant's experience, so infant under one, what their experience is going to be like of the electrophysiological workup. And we do much more with this than this with older children. But here's what the test is like. We start with introductions, a really key point, because if the parents aren't on side and don't fully understand what's going to happen or what their role should be, you're going to struggle to get um, uh, good recordings. Putting on the electrodes, you need six. Three VUP electrodes across the back, some form of ground, an ERG electrode under the eye, and a reference electrode. You've got to be fast and deft with this. This is when they tend to get upset. Dummies, pacifiers, bottles, all great news there. And then you're on to the recording phase. Now, you've got your baby sitting happily, watching the flash of light, hopefully happily. You're going to start with both eyes open capture the flash VP and simultaneously get the ERG. You've got a repetition rate of about um, two hertz, even one hertz, you're going to get a nice recording within one or two minutes. If there's indications that the ERG is of interest, you may want to press on with flicker ERGs and briefly dark adapt to get some estimation of rod function. 
But if you're leaning towards an organism diagnosis, get the patch on the eye and get the VP from the right eye and swap over and get the VP from the left eye. So you may capture everything you need to either rule out or pick up a retinal or a um, excessive chiasmal crossing problem in around five minutes. Okay, a brief word about the retina. This is just a little recording I did a couple of days ago on my colleague Kirsten Graham in clinic. So in clinic, I find the kids prefer non-contact stimulus. They like the, the flash lamp in front of them. They can play with and touch rather than something on their face. Other people have different experiences. I tend to use my retinal in theatre for the very small number of children that go each year for examination under anaesthetic or for children who are in the neonatal intensive care unit. But it's really useful in older kids. Um, and as you can see, if, if you have a, a kid as cooperative as, as Kirsten can be here, um, as an adult, then you're going to get nice recordings. It's really intuitive, quick and easy to use. And one of the excellent use cases that I've been discussing with some services that I've been advising recently is being able to use this. Um, in the UK, we have terrible waiting lists post-COVID with our adult and itch diagnostic services. And this gives you the opportunity of um, using a different room than your electrophysiology room. You only need a space that can be dark and maybe not using the same personnel as you would typically use to do your electrodiagnostic testing. Uh, and you can see here, um, handheld device, um, and we've got real-time pupillometry there to make sure you've got a good uh, position. And then I'll just unclip the uh, retival there and um, show you the ERG that we've just recorded. That was one minute and 30 seconds, and you can see a nice normal light adapted ERG with the A and B wave falling within the reference limits there. So I talked about this very briefly in the introduction. My service is a tertiary paediatric service, um, and it's in a city called Glasgow, which is in Scotland in the United Kingdom. We see about 400 kids a year, and lots of those come to us for investigation of their nystagmus. Back in about 2006, we noticed that some of those had this history of maternal methadone use in their pregnancy but we weren't finding retinal disorders or albinism in them. And we collected these kids for a while and then we published this retrospective observational case series. At about 50 miles to the east of us in Edinburgh in, in Scotland, our colleagues had noticed and um, had published a, a similar pattern. Now, if the, you look at the tourist books about Glasgow, they'll probably show you this. So this is my university, one of three universities in Glasgow. It was founded in 1451. This building's a lot newer than that when the university moved to its current position in the very affluent and leafy west end of the city. But not all of Glasgow looks like that. Like lots of European cities and cities elsewhere, there is also um, great poverty and uh, associated with that crime and drug misuse. And same goes for Edinburgh which was the setting for this film, some of you might remember, um, called Train Spotting, which was about heroin misuse, which in the early 80s exploded in the UK. Um, this was largely due to new supply routes, but there were other socioeconomic factors involved. And at its peak in 2005, almost one in every 100 adults in the UK were using heroin. This made the UK one of the countries with the highest prevalence of opiate use in the world, according to the 2009 World Drug Report. And if we treated Glasgow as a country, it would have been second worldwide. Just a brief history. When I say opioids, I mean either the synthetic or prescription opioids, such as fentanyl or methadone, or the extracts from the opium poppy, the opiates. And we've known from um, antiquity of the, uh, the poppy and the use of opioids for pleasure, for pain relief, and so on. But more recently, uh, wave after wave of opioid misuse epidemic has swept across parts of the world, in Europe, in North America, and elsewhere. And the current opioid, method, uh, opioid epidemic we hear so much about um, has stemmed partly from the mistaken belief that opioids prescribed for pain relief were not addictive. As of two years ago, over 50 million people worldwide used or misused opioids. One of the ways of managing this as a disorder is through harm reduction policies, one branch of which will include opioid maintenance treatment 
with drugs such as methadone, a synthetic opioid. And this graph here shows the number of dispense items of methadone in Scotland through um, mirroring and lagging the heroin epidemic. About two in every five drug misusers is female, and addiction tends to occur during their fertile years, leaving implications for pregnancies. In 2018, in the USA, more than 5% of pregnant women reported illicit drug use in the past month, and 1% of the pregnant population had used opioids. Now, opioid maintenance therapy, here's what we do know about it. It is very good for mothers. It stabilizes their lifestyle, helps them engage with health services, and not use illicit street drugs as much. It's very good for babies. You get fewer premature babies or growth-restricted babies and fewer fetal deaths. Neonatal abstinence syndrome occurs. That's withdrawal from the drug on birth, but otherwise there are no adverse effects according to the medical guidelines that are still current. We can examine that a bit more closely with our current 2021 perspective. Opioids or endogenous opioids are important for brain growth and development, but there is growing evidence of a systemic neuroinflammatory process associated with methadone exposure leading to sustained central nervous system damage. It impacts growth. Babies have lower birth weights and are shorter, but they also have smaller heads and their, the smallness of their heads is disproportionately reduced compared to their bodies. And this is probably driven by smaller brain volumes. Now, neonatal abstinence syndrome is um, generally now termed as neonatal opioid withdrawal symptom. Now, is about half of all babies do suffer some form of withdrawal with some or all of these, and around half of them will need some sort of treatment. So this takes us to where we are here. So now we better realize the potential for harm. But going back to 2006, despite the official advice that there was no long-term adverse effects, we asked where the problems that we were seeing in clinics in children exposed to methadones related to their exposure. And we began to address this by running this prospective control cohort study, which first recruited in 2009. We recruited 152 infants, or mothers in fact, and 102 of them born to mothers prescribed methadone during their pregnancy and 50 comparison children. This was really hard to do. We matched them for birth weight, gestation, feeding and socioeconomic group. We weren't quite able to match for maternal smoking, head circumference, or in those in whom we tested it, excess alcohol. But all 152 were born at full term with no congenital ocular abnormalities, no significant neonatal illness. And the program of study went as follows. In the first few days after birth, we recorded their flash VPs. We watched to see if there was any withdrawal and noted this. At six months old, we invited all the children back for more VPs and neurodevelopmental and visual assessment. And aged around eight, nine, or 10, we asked them all back for comprehensive visual and behavioral assessments. And I'll run through our findings from those stages. Neonatal findings which are published. First of all, the exposure. We established drug exposure in this really unique cohort through a combination of case note review and maternal interview. But also by biochemical analysis of maternal urine, infant urine, and infant meconium. That is quite a unique combination to give very robust knowledge of the exact exposure of all of these children. In another note, almost every mother who was eligible that we approached consented to take part, making this effectively an unselected group and therefore a very valuable cohort. This is the exposure data matching findings from elsewhere. Most of the mothers, 91 of 102, used other multiple other illicit or illicit drugs during their pregnancy, predominantly opiates, benzodiazepines, and cannabis. Only 17 were opioid only. Here's what we find the flash VEPs. These are some tracings. Here's the infant getting the VEP recorded and they're caught. And we found abnormalities in the, in the exposed infants. These were um, less, uh, fewer features, more abnormal waveforms, or smaller amplitudes. And these were independently associated with the methadone exposure and existed even after correcting for the factors we weren't able to match. When we invited the children back at six months, we had some attrition. 
but our non-attenders matched for most of these neonatal factors, meaning the bias was likely to be less. We found a lot of VEP abnormalities, but what really appalled us when we did the vision assessment, we found that 40% of the drug-exposed infants failed their vision test, and we predefined a fail in terms of poor acuity or presence of strabismus <clears throat> or presence of nystagmus. So you can see the green bars refer to the drug exposed children and the white bars refer to the comparison infants. And we found a tenfold increase in strabismus in the drug exposed children and a 300 fold incidence, and I mean relative to the population at large, of nystagmus. Really quite staggering amount. So now I can bring you up to date. Um, this is unpublished data still, so it would be very grateful if it wasn't copied or distributed. We haven't finished analysis on this. But these children are all now eight or 10 to 10 years old, a little bit older now. And we brought them back for this very comprehensive assessment. I'll just focus in here on the visual component at the moment, where we really concentrated on assessing binocular vision, including infrared eye movement recordings. Lots of the children couldn't be contacted or couldn't attend. And for them, we did a comprehensive case note review. So of the 102 exposed infants, we got 22 back in person, and the, most of the remainder, we pulled our data from their case notes. With the comparisons, we had 11 who attended in person, and again, we used case notes. Comparisons of some factors. Tragically, 14 of the opioid exposed children's mothers were deceased at the time of um, investigation, and slightly over half of them were no longer living with a birth parent, very different to the comparison group. 65% of these children had already been in hospital eye services, um, and in none had we found diagnoses of retinal disorders or albinisms or other explanations for uh, their visual difficulties. So here's what we found when we looked at all 144 children on whom we had data at all, 99 exposed children versus 45 comparison children. And again, shockingly, we found that 60% of our exposed children failed, defining fail as listed down here, where only 27% of our comparison children failed. And again, you can see this predominance of strabismus and nystagmus as being the cause of the failure in the opioid exposed children. 20 fold what we expected to see in the population at large. And we found 21 individual children opioid exposed who had nystagmus, which is at least 80 fold that that you might expect in the population at large. Now I told you about the 33 who attended in person for that very comprehensive assessment. And here briefly are their findings. 14 of the 22 who were opioid exposed failed for these problems, and two of the 11 comparison children failed for these problems. So that's 63 versus 18% and the difference of 45. Its confidence interval is 10 to 67, excludes zero is significant. And despite the high attrition, we've got well-matched neonatal attributes and the risk of bias is low. Let's just focus in on the eye movement recording. So this is a little clip of what we did. This is actually me demonstrating it here. And we're um, looking at the, the results here for the 27 children who completed. 19 of those were opioid exposed, and six of them showed nystagmus on their eye movements. Zero comparison children did. So here we're simply looking straight ahead, both eyes open. And then we repeat looking straight ahead with one eye at a time covered. And here are the eye movement recordings from one, two, three, four, five, the six opioid exposed, exposed children. And for comparison, here's a child with no nystagmus at all. These are 20 second recordings. Sometimes there's only 10 seconds of data. And we plot a rightward movement of the eye up and down, red eye recordings. Red recordings are from the right eye and black from the left. And you can see the features of these nystagmus. In all six children, it's horizontal. Strabismus is present, or microstrabismus in all six. The amplitude of the nystagmus increases with occlusion, and the direction is to the right with right eye viewing and to the left with left eye viewing. This confirms the characteristics of fusion maldevelopment nystagmus syndrome in these children. So let's summarize. 
In the whole cohort, we found abnormal vision in 60% of the exposed children versus 27% for comparison with this predominance of strabismus and nystagmus. And our detailed investigation of the subset of 33 children helped us identify nystagmus as fusion maldevelopment nystagmus syndrome. I'm reminding you here of how unique this cohort is, being unselected and having this comprehensive exposure data. High attrition but low bias, we feel. And interestingly, neither the drug exposure nor NES, neonatal abscess syndrome or withdrawal at birth, predicted the visual outcome. The problems that we've described here show a spectrum of failure of binocular visual development from which we postulate an opioid teratogenic effect, which causes loss of binocular connections within the striate cortex. Is this part of a fetal opioid syndrome? So many questions still to ask. Is this simply about methadone? And we have behavioral data and um, photograph, um, photographs of faces to look for fetal alcohol spectrum disorder too. Much more to do. So how, how do we know whether we're seeing something that's normal here? Who else has described it? Well, interestingly, you can go back as far as 1947 and this JAMA publication from Chicago that describes mothers addicted to morphine and a daughter born with nystagmus to that mother. And other early papers from North America describing nystagmus and strabismus in mothers using um, heroin and methadone. And then a plethora of reports from across Europe, including here is our um, retrospective case series. And here are the data from the cohort of 152 I've just been describing. And the pattern is similar, nystagmus, stereopsis, um, uh, strabismus, um, impaired binocular vision and eye movements. And more recently, we've talked about the opioid um, epidemic happening in North America. And here, as you might expect, more recent reports possibly reflecting that from Boston, Baltimore, Cincinnati and Ohio, strabismus and nystagmus. Is it just vision? No. There's lots of data supporting brain issues, problems with connective tracts, white matter injury, structural anomalies, and a plethora of evidence, some from um, large systematic reviews and meta-analyses, showing impaired general development associated with opioid exposure, developmental delays in all um, areas, low IQ, behavioral problems, uh, difficulties with regulation of behavior and emotions. These are really difficult studies to do because of the poor rates of follow-up and the social factors that can confound these. But nonetheless, it points to an umbrella of problems. So where does this take us? The public message about methadone and other substitute treatments is that it's safe. This is an email I got from a mother in North America, and I'd like you just to take a moment to read this. So that's anecdotal, but this is the take home message from the content of, of everything I've described here. Prenatal opioid exposure is not good for eyes or for development. The adverse effects persist throughout childhood. We know that neonatal withdrawal is not a prerequisite for longer term problems. So I'm exhorting you when you see children in your clinics with nystagmus, please ask, about prenatal opioid exposure. And I'd like to acknowledge all my co-investigators, collaborators, and funders. Thank you so much. Oh. I have to say that, you know, especially that email, it's really, touching you know i think you you have raised the issue that that it's so important and this this study is great 
I just want to say to the audience one thing, just to not to forget that please respect the, the rights that this is unpublished data, so it's not meant to be spread around. Yes, you will get the recording of that, but please always keep it in mind. So, Dr. Hamilton, thank you very much. It was really very interesting, and I think your 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 research is it's really important. I'm still touched. <laughs> you can hear that. Anyway, our dear audience, um, just to remind you how to ask the question, we already quite have a quite a few questions. So remember, if we don't answer them online, we will answer you afterwards. So open the panel. If you are on the computer, open this function and type your question. On the mobile device, click on the question mark icon and ask us the question. So, Dr. Hamilton, are you ready for the first question? Yes, I'd love to hear them. Okay. So, since I am not native English, it will take time to read them. When a child with nystagmus, an assumed or known opioid use, presents to your clinic, what ERG test do you recommend to use? Does the test procedure change based on the knowledge of opioid use? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so probably I would say with the, the people who are referring children to me are probably fairly aware of this issue. And providing they were happy that they couldn't see any fundal abnormalities, nor that there was any indications of a likelihood of albinism, they probably wouldn't send these children for electrophysiology. But if they were unsure, if they maybe couldn't get a good fundal view, or maybe there was a bit of confounding family history, then um, these, these kids would get exactly the same workup as any other kid with nystagmus. We would be focusing on the ERG to make sure we're not we're not missing a retinal issue, and we'd also be checking monocular lateral VPs to make sure the chiasmal crossing was normal too. Thank you. I think that I will take the next question, which I find very logical. So, does the knowledge of previous opioid chain uh, use would change your treatment strategy? So, the treatment strategy is. A really interesting question and not one I'm not an ophthalmologist I'm not in a good position to answer that um, what my pediatric colleagues are very aware of is the need for um, for awareness of these children um, we, we found children in our study who were doing fine at six months old but struggling at school age um, and because of the behavioral difficulties they're going to need more support through school um, and that's something that you know, education and social and medical practitioners need to work together for. Um, the, the same um, uh, treatments that might be successful for strabismus and for nystagmus are exactly the same um, whether the FMNS is, is due to opioid exposure or not. Okay, thank you. I think it's very challenging to convince those parents to continue also, yeah? That's probably another yeah. challenge. Yeah. Well, as, yeah, I mean, as we saw from our data, the chances are um, that a lot of these children are going to end up in care. So they're going to be adopted or they're going to be in kinship care and um, or fostered. And usually that can help with better engagement with health services. Hmm. OK, so the next question. Very interesting. Could you see any dependency between the frequency of methadone or intensity of methadone use and severity of disease? Yeah, so no. So exactly in the same way that we don't see a relationship between the um, trimester um, pattern of, of um, methadone use or the dose of methadone use with infant withdrawal. Similarly, we saw lots of kids in our series who whose mothers were on very high doses of methadone, whose children went on, the babies went on and had quite severe withdrawal at birth, but nonetheless, their vision was fine. So there is no pattern. And if you only looked at babies who withdrew or babies whose mothers used high methadone doses and you wanted to check their vision in later life, you would miss a lot of the problems. It just doesn't predict it as far as we can see. Okay, thank you. So next question is, um... Retinal microanatomy at birth, that's a question mark, that it's receptors, outer sets. I'm not uh, sure. 
say that again for me, Monica. Yeah, retinal microanatomy at birth. And then the second part of the question is photoreceptors, outer sets. I think that's maybe uh, a suggestion okay. for the yeah, other. I, mm, I don't know the answer to that. And I also don't know of any, any data that's been looked at from elsewhere. So I'll keep an eye out for that. Okay. So then we have another one, amazing information. I also need to read that. <laughs> You have demonstrated those alarming vision effects from methadone drug exposure. Thank you very much. Could you share any standards for the Trolland infant test with 10 milliliters dark adapted test? Is there a reference? And thank you very much, Dr. Hamilton and sponsors and all helpful and important, very nice <laughs> message we got, so. Yes, thanks, a lovely message. Um, so I think you're asking if, if you use the constant Trolan setting on the retabar with infants, are there reference data available for, for the infants? Ten, so, yeah, yeah. With 10 Make, minutes dark adaptation. Uh, with 10 yeah. minutes dark adaptation. Oh, I see, with shorter dark adaptation. Right, okay. Yes. So, um, so the answer with, for that is, uh, what a great question, um, not published that I know because I think almost all of the published reference data is for the 20 minute stark adaptation. I know that Dorothy Thompson's group at Great Ormond Street um, ha have this data which might be about to be published. Um, what we do have is lots of information from adults where we shortened the dark adaptation time from 20 minutes down to 10 minutes. And it made no difference whatsoever to the dark adaptive three or the dark adaptive 10 ERG. It very slightly um, left us with um, smaller dark adaptive 0.01 ERGs, but they're not particularly reliable in neonates anyway, um, because they tend to be so small. So you can pretty much transfer your reference data um, when you shorten down by um, adjusting and scaling accordingly. And there's a paper that's just been published by myself, in fact, co-authored with one of the other vice presidents of LKC about how to collect reference data or how to use reference data from elsewhere or to scale it to suit your own particular setup, which you might find useful. That's in Documenta or Pharmalogica. Thank you. Um, if there is no problem in retina, why do you use ERG? Okay, um, well, I guess you're only going to do the ERG to make sure you've not missed a retinal problem. Um, mm -hmm. So so a child that turns up in clinic, um, first of all, an adoptive child, for example, the adoptive parents may not know of, of exactly what exposures there were in birth. Often they will know if there's alcohol exposure um, or if the mother smokes, but they may not know about everything else. So your history taking might not necessarily point you straight towards an opioid exposure. Um, in which case you're going to want to do an ERG on any kid with an unexplained nystagmus, one of the things you're going to want to do is rule out a retinal disorder. I have a feeling like our audience was like talking to each other because your answer is very much connected to the next question. Does the data stratified by tobacco versus marijuana smoke, change of penetrance of nystagmus, strabismus, or reduce best corrected visual acuity? Yeah, such a great question. Um, I think you probably need to give us a couple more months to finish analyzing our data when we can tell you that. Um, you know, not only are these data um, unpublished, which, which I very um, respectfully ask for it not to be copied for that reason, but of course it hasn't yet been peer reviewed. Um, and so for that really Im important point, these are preliminary findings as it pertains to the older children. The neonatal stuff and the six month stuff is all published and, and peer reviewed. Um, so questions like that um, are as yet, um, we don't know. We'll, well, please watch out for our publications, which will hopefully address that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so next one, I start with the nice feedback, dear Dr. Hamilton, thank you very much for the interesting talk. I was wondering if it's possible to record an ERG with patient having nystagmus. Is it possible to denoise the traces? <laughs> yeah, it can be tricky, can't it? Um, because of the eye movements. Um, and in fact, it's one place where using a skin electrode rather than anything contacting the cornea really helps you out because the skin electrodes is much less vulnerable to the motion artifacts. And I know what you mean. I, I mean, sometimes recording an ERG with a, a burial electrode in someone with nystagmus, you just you get nothing. 
because the whole apparatus is in constant movement. Um, so there's lots of tricks that you can use. So you can allow the child to, to find their null point, to, to, so you're dampening the stagmus as much as possible. You can use your skin electrodes. You can also um, switch off your um, artifact rejection because often what you'll find is there's actually a really nice ERG, even though it's riding on a big old load of muscle artifact because of the nystagmus. And so you can just capture everything and then weed out all the ones afterwards that are rubbish and that will leave you with the, the, the good traces that will hold the ERG in them. But it is challenging, definitely. OK, um, next question. We have many of them left. <laughs> Is there any data comparing babies with IUDE to heroin versus methadone? Assumption would be that both are opioids, so both are bad. Is there any direction we can go to reduce the incidence, other than the obvious need to reduce opioid use in general? Um, so no, we don't know about heroin versus methadone. And part of the reason for that is that babies that tend to have been exposed only to methadone, we just don't know about them because they tend, I mean, if you're on a methadone maintenance program, you're in constant touch with medical professionals throughout your pregnancy. Um, and, and that was, I mean, they were recruited because we were able to contact them. A mother who's using heroin throughout her pregnancy um, isn't, it, this isn't something you, you, you will know about necessarily as their obstetrician. Uh, I think there was a second part to that question. Yes, that was um, just a second. Um, so, is there any direction we can go to reduce the incidence? Uh -huh. Yeah, obviously, um, yeah. Use in general. I know. Hmm. I mean, I, I haven't the expertise to speak to that. Um, I'm a I'm a clinical scientist. Um, th these are issues that that have to rest with. Um, um, addiction specialists, primary care medics, that's, that's, they're the experts in those things. Um, I might have ideas, but they're just my ideas. They're not based on, on a full understanding of the picture. I think we will get you in touch with the person that asks, and then you can discuss that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Have ERG device, Asian normative database, especially pregnant women. So probably the question is that do we have any normative or reference database for pregnant Asian pregnant women for Gosh, ERG? What a, what a great question. Um, the answer to that is not that I know of. And also, I'm not sure that there's any evidence that your ERG changes in pregnancy. I know that there's there's one of the, the um, North, uh, French Canadian groups has shown it can change with the stage of menstrual cycle, um, but they're small, quite subtle changes. Um, I have no idea about pregnancy. The ERG does certainly change with, with race. Um, the more um, darkly pigmented you are, generally your ERG is, is somewhat smaller. Um, and there's good, there's lots of good published data on that. Um, one of my PhD students, Al Abdul Said, published um, on that with Daphne McCulloch. Um, so race does make a difference in terms of how the pigmentation level affects the ERG. So um, I, I haven't come across se separately developed reference data sets for that though. So I'm in Ghana, that's an expression. I'm in Ghana and cannabis abuse is a common abuse drug, commoner abuse drug than opioids. It has to do with the access. The children whose mothers were on cannabis exhibit similar or different symptoms, signs compared to methadone. Yeah, um, so as far as I know, um, there isn't any particular evidence supporting long-term visual problems after cannabis um, misuse, but um, there are certainly other attributes in children, um, behavioral and cognitive defects that have been reported. Um, again, my colleague Helen McTeer published a very nice um, synopsis of how various drugs of misuse will affect um, uh, pediatric outcomes, and uh, I'd refer you to that for a really good description. Okay. Okay, next question. In my clinic, there is still a lot of mothers that become sober and maintain care of their babies as they grow up. I can remember telling a mom that I believe that her baby's nystagmus and poor vision was relating to the methadone. She became very upset and she has told that 
she was told that there would be no negative co consequences or for the baby. So the outcome was not matching the expectation. I think it's more the statement than the, the question, but I think that that's probably confirm what you presented to us today. And eh? that's however yeah, like it's so sad to hear, but I think you know, you know, we have to keep keep a very measured um approach here. Methadone is not the bad guy. You know, as I presented one of my slides, being on methadone is really good for pregnant women because it helps reduce their illicit drug use and it helps keep them engaged with healthcare. Um, it can really help them come off um, and improve their addictions over a longer period. And it's really good for fetuses because it helps their growth and it, it reduces the number of fetal deaths that we might see. Um, so it's not the bad guy here, the picture is complex and the, um, the, rec uh, the recommendations that we have from, from NICE and all the other um, organizations uh, we, we are we are only just beginning to put together, put two and two together and associate visual problems with with this in utero exposure. Uh, we don't even know if it's just methadone or if it's all opioids. Um, so the picture is very unclear. And while the picture is unclear to us, we certainly can't give a clear picture to, to um, expecting women other than to tell them what we already know, which is your methadone is going to be good for you on the whole. OK, thank you. So, um, do you have any data related with prenatal alcohol exposure or retinal development? Uh, yes, I'm going to refer again to Dr. McTeer's publication, which gives a synopsis of this. There is an association of fetal alcohol exposure and strabismus, that much is known, um, not with nystagmus. Um, and they are quite well documented, the, the sequelae of, of alcohol exposure. Okay. Okay. Are there any studies on the utero suboxone use? Oh, um, not that I know of. Okay. And uh, next question. Have you used animal models with opioid energy? No, not me personally, but I know that there are groups that work on um, rat models of um, opioid exposure. But, you know, we're, we're postulating a, an impact on the development of the binocular system. And of course, um, neurine binocularity is very different to human. So I'm not sure if it would be a good model for the particular visual aspects that we're describing. Hmm. Okay, so another question, one question a bit off topic, however, maybe you can answer. When there is a baby with suspect shaken baby syndrome, what would you recommend to do? So <laughs> I think we are getting yeah, into a kind of I social just, topic. I mean, but yeah, it is, I mean, yes, another tragic um, situation. So, so th that, that's, I think there are very well understood international guidelines on, on um, shaken baby syndrome and from, from an eye perspective, our ophthalmologists would obviously be looking for evidence of retinal hemorrhage amongst other, other factors that are sought. Okay, so we could continue, there are still few unanswered questions, but unfortunately the time does not allow us, so I would like to ask my favourite last question. And I think especially after your presentation, many of, of the audience would like also to know what's next. So yes, what's next? Well, you can see we still have work to do um, with this particular study to, to complete the analysis and, and to publish this. Um, and then we have a job with um, taking that data and making it clear to policymakers what we found um, because it's got important repercussions for, for public health and so on. Um, there are other possibilities, of course, because we're now in a, a, a really great era of, of big data. And um, in the UK, we're particularly fortunate by having a national health service where our data um, is, is held in such a way that it can be accessed anonymously. And one potential route to look at next is um, com contrasting our infant data or the neonatal data that's acquired that tells you about exposures, for example. And then we also do um, vision screening on all children in this country around about the age of four. 
and um, a very useful exercise would be to scrape all of that data and look for associations. But my next big thing is um, we're developing a, an apnea t-shirt to try and um, identify at home obstructive sleep apnea in, in toddlers prior to tonsillectomy. So that's something altogether different, but keeping us busy at the moment. Thank you. It's it's exciting future to come. So there are still a few years for you as the as the president. Once again, thank you very much for your time, for joining us for this interesting presentation. It's it's really great to see that someone does this kind of research. However, we are touched by that. I just would like to remind remind the audience that that was our fourth session of the series. So they are three previous recordings available online. And uh, any of you that needs more information, or of course also can, wants to pick up the recording, you can uh, visit our website, and then you can get to know a little bit more. And a little bit off the, the topic, but I was allowed to say that during the summertime, we will have a um, little series for beginners. So if you know someone that think about getting into RG or wants to learn the basics. So please follow us on the LKC. Again, my colleagues and me had some, some ideas. And Dr. Hamilton, thank you once again very much for your presentation. Really appreciate that. And thank you for your time. And I wish you the relaxing evening. And many of our audience is actually from very early morning time zone. So I wish you a good working day and hopefully see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.